All right, thank you, Dave. Well, let's turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 12, and we'll be looking at Acts chapter 12, verse 25, through chapter 13 and verse 3. And tonight we're going to be starting a new study, the first missionary journey, uh, sometimes referred to as Paul's first missionary journey. And uh, as we get started, I um, just want to come up with a trivia question to get our minds flowing this evening. And the question is, before we get started, is what is the name of the city where Paul's journeys launched from? So again, in the book of Acts, there's a prominent city where the missionary journeys of Paul, they launched from. That's right, it's Antioch. So Antioch is the answer to the question, and uh, you'll see Antioch being prominent this evening, but also with regards to his other missionary journeys as well. Well, as we get started tonight, you'll notice in the handout has a good bit of background information, but if you like to take notes, the way that we'll be having the study tonight is the first thing we'll do is we're going to do an overview of the handout. And then after that, we will look at verses 25 of Acts chapter 12 through chapter 13 and verse 1, and that is the church at Antioch. So we'll see what we can learn from the church at Antioch. And then finally, we'll conclude in verses 2 through 3 of Acts 13, entitled Set Apart by the Holy Spirit. So again, we'll look at the background via the handout. We'll look at verse 25 of Acts chapter 12 through 13, 1, those two verses in the church at Antioch. And then finally, we'll conclude in verses 2 through 3 of chapter 13, set apart by the Holy Spirit. Now, in the handout that I gave you, it provides you with a general overview to get ourselves situated for the first missionary journey. So again, not being a full study of the book of Acts, but this will at least give you a general idea uh, just to familiarize yourself with the book. The author of Acts is Luke and the dating of the book in terms of when it was written somewhere around 61 to 62 AD. Now this should not be confused with the actual missionary journey. So the book itself written by Luke somewhere around 61, 62 AD, just approximately. Now in terms of the missionary journey, the first one, usually the dating is going to be somewhere between 46 and 48 AD. This book, the book of Acts, I like to call it the sequel to Luke. And uh, so if you were to take Luke and then continue on through Acts, you have a really good if you will, historical summary of the church, how it came to be. So you have in Luke, of course, very early days prior to the birth of Jesus, the life of Christ, his ascension, and then in Acts chapter 1, of course, it connects with the ascension there and takes us all the way to where Paul is in Rome. Now, I put on there a summary statement, and the summary statement comes from Charles Ryrie, in the summary statement says, Acts gives us the record of the spread of Christianity from the coming of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost to Paul's arrival in Rome to preach the gospel in the world's capital. Now another way to think of the book in terms of the missionary journey or the structure of the book is that the first 12 chapters largely, not entirely, but as I said, largely deal with Peter and the early church in terms of there in Jerusalem. But then in chapters 13 through 28, the change is with that it deals largely with Paul. So again, just as a way to think of it, the first 12 chapters are largely dealing with what we would think of as Peter, as well as some of the other apostles there in Jerusalem. And then in chapter 13 through 28, they're largely dealing with Paul as he goes through uh, the various missionary journeys. Now, uh, 
one of the things to think about, and I want you to turn to Acts chapter 1, so hold your place there in Acts chapter 12 and turn to chapter 1. You'll notice in verse 4 of Acts 1, and I'm just going to read it, Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he had said you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and essentially what he tells them to do is, he's going to return to the Father via the the ascension, which is what we see in verses 9 through 11, they need to still wait. They don't have the power in themselves to do what is needed. They need to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And then once the Holy Spirit comes, the question is, well, okay, then what do they do? Well, the key verse in many ways of the entire book is verse 8. So chapter 1 and verse 8 Jesus tells them not to be, if you will, preoccupied with when the Father will have the establishment or the res restoration of the kingdom of Israel. He says, in other words, in verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So that's Pentecost. But notice the rest, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest part of of the earth and that's essentially the trajectory of the book the outline that I gave you and you see how it fits with the missionary journey of Paul in the first chapters of the book so chapter 1 through 8 the church is in Jerusalem the church gets if you will somewhat stagnant uh, they don't carry the gospel out as the Lord instructed in Acts 1.8. Persecution comes, and we know that persecution in that chapter, chapter 8, comes from Saul. The persecution causes the church to go where? Well, it causes it to spread to Judea and Samaria. And then in chapter 13, which is where we'll be starting in a few moments, is when Paul begins to, of course along with Barnabas, uh, it takes the gospel to the remotest parts of the known world at the time, and that's the structure of the book. So the book follows Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 in terms of its flow, in terms of how it's structured as well. Now before we look at the verses tonight that we talked about, I want you to think about and just consider for tonight and in the weeks ahead that the Holy Spirit works in and through the believers to spread the gospel from Jerusalem to Rome. And he does the same today. He works in and through believers today to carry out his work, whether that be through the spreading of the gospel, the way in which the church should function, the guiding and leading of the church, one of the titles of the book of Acts, of course, many of us think of it as Acts or the Acts of the Apostles, but many people call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And of course, both is true. The book shows the Acts of the Apostles, the early days, but it equally shows the Acts of the Holy Spirit, and we'll begin to see that in particular tonight as well. Alright, so let's continue by looking at the church at Antioch, and we're going to pick up in the last verse of chapter 12, that's verse 25, and read through chapter 13 and verse 1, and it'll make a little more sense, hopefully, when uh, we look at it. So let me just read it. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission taken along with them John, who was also called Mark. Now there were at Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. So what you have here, and the reason why I pick up in verse 25, is that 
what you have is is after delivering the gift that the Christians at Antioch had given to the church in Jerusalem so that's Acts chapter 11 verses 29 through 30 Barnabas and Saul return to Antioch and this time of course they as you note when I read it they take along with them John Mark so if you look at the map that's on the handout basically what you have is that the Christians again they decide in Antioch they're going to give a gift and send a gift to the church in Jerusalem they select and use Paul and Barnabas Paul and Barnabas go they deliver the gift and now they have returned to Antioch with John Mark now what verse 25 also does is it introduces us to what we would think of as the three missionaries that will be used on the mission trip that we'll be seeing in a moment and the three missionaries you'll see there in verse 25 Barnabas, Saul, and John Mark. Now let's look at these because of course Barnabas and Saul are the prominent ones and you will see that and of course John Mark is used as the helper but in any event the three of them go as follows. So Barnabas we know has a nickname and the nickname is the son of encouragement we find that in Acts chapter 4 and verse 36 Barnabas was known as an encourager and uh, so we see that as being one of the characteristics of Barnabas and so he ended up with having the name of the son of encouragement and his name also is at least the other name he uses is Joseph and then we have Saul Saul is the Jewish name of Paul so you have Saul who we will see as Paul's name later on Paul being the if you will Hellenistic name so again the second individual there mentioned is Saul Saul is his Jewish name and Paul being the Hellenistic name you'll notice in verse 9 of chapter 13 it says but Saul who was also known as Paul so what you have there is the idea of dual names and that's the basic way to think of it is that when we think of Paul the Apostle Paul he had dual names he had Saul which is his Jewish name and then Paul being the Hellenistic name now curiously enough once Paul begins to go into at least heavily into the Gentile territories that he does you'll notice that Luke makes a change where he no longer refers to him as Saul but Paul and if you think about it it makes sense if Peter was largely the apostle to the Jews and Saul slash Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles it would make sense that he would use if you will a Hellenistic name that being Paul and we'll see more on that later so we have Barnabas, we have Saul, and then we have John Mark. John Mark's mother's name was Mary. A lot of Marys in the Bible, especially in the Gospels. And she is mentioned in Acts chapter 12, verse 12. And that was one of the locations that they would go to. And they were gathered together for such things as prayer. We know that John Mark is also Barnabas' cousin. And you'll find that in Colossians chapter 4 and in verse 10. Now the last one, hopefully everyone here gets this one, which is John Mark would go on to write one of the books of the New Testament, and it is, anyone guess? Right, the Gospel of Mark so this is who we're looking at here so again we have three missionaries that are introduced they will be the primary ones who go on this first missionary journey that's Barnabas Saul and then John Mark now as I read chapter 13 and verse 1 you'll notice that the focus there is the church in Antioch so if you look at the Bible map or the map that I gave you on the handout you'll find Antioch on there 
Uh, Antioch is an important city to know in terms of, in particular, the book of Acts, the early days of the church, because there's so much that comes out of there in terms of missionaries, but a few other things we'll note. Now, the way to locate it, if you have a Bible map and it might be easier to see it, find Jerusalem and go north and you will find Antioch towards the almost elbow area up there in the northern area you'll find Antioch. Now Antioch is interesting for various reasons. It was a Roman province of Syria which you'll notice that on the map. It was cosmopolitan. Uh, it had a lot of different cultures and ethical backgrounds so what you have there is if I could say it this way, a plurality of backgrounds, ethic, ethnics, and people. And that is what happens with the church. And we'll look at that in a few moments. A variety of people at the church there. As I already mentioned, there were major missionary journeys launched there. All three of Paul's launched from Antioch. But there's also one other item related to Antioch that's important. And we find that in Acts chapter 11 in verse 26. Acts chapter 11 verse 26 you'll notice something about Antioch. And when he had found him he brought him to Antioch. This is of course speaking here of Saul. And for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So one other aspect there Prior to that, sometimes referred to as the Way, we see in Antioch, that was the first place where the name or usage of Christian there in Acts 11.26. Now, as I mentioned, the church at Antioch is no different than any other, uh, other church that has been around, and generally speaking, it isn't. And what I mean by that is the church in Antioch consisted of various people who also had various gifts. They were given certain gifts to be used. And you can find this in verse 1. Now notice the variety of people. Now we've already mentioned Barnabas, Saul, and John Mark. But notice the others. You have Simeon, who is called Niger. In Greek that means black or dark-skinned. So some suggest that perhaps he had something African in him, something of that nature, but nevertheless a uniqueness there. Then you have Lucius. Lucius is a Roman name of Cyrene. So again you have Simeon and Lucius, those both being different. The third one that I'm going to mention, and it's the last one here, is Manian. Manian is curious because you'll notice how it says who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. So you have Niger, you have Lucius, and then you have Manian who was brought up. Now that phrase brought up in Greek can mean foster brother, but in particular notice who it is, Herod the Tetrarch. That is at that point in time Herod Antipas, and we know him to be the one who had John the Baptist beheaded. So again, it's curious, of course, Manian takes a different trajectory in life than Herod, but you just have a variety of people. So not only do you have Barnabas, Saul, and John Mark, but you have Simeon, Lucius, and Manian, all of which, these are all unique, different people that were brought into the body of Christ there at Antioch. I'm going to read something to you. It's a quote from William MacDonald. He says, A new measuring stick has been brought into being. It is not who you are, but whose you are. And that's a good quote for this, and it's a good way to think of it. When a person comes to faith in Jesus Christ, their past doesn't really matter. And what I mean by that is who they are in the past, whether that be that they came from, in this case, Simeon in his background, Lucius in his background, or Manian in his background, Barnabas, Saul, John Mark, no matter who they were in the past, 
their backgrounds all vary all of that doesn't really matter in the sense that they are all part of the body of Christ whose they are well they're Christ they're the Lord Jesus is Christ sheep and so what you see there so that's a helpful way to think of it when we come to Christ and we begin to become part of the body of Christ and participate in the local church it doesn't matter who we are meaning our past because there's going to be varied backgrounds what is important is whose we are and that's the Lord Jesus Christ sheep now I mentioned not only is there various people but there's various gifts two of which are mentioned here the first is prophets they had prophets there during that time now when we think of the prophets we think of proclamation thus says the Lord they received sometimes divine revelation they received instruction uh, you can actually see this in the church at Antioch in Acts chapter 11 Acts chapter 11 in verse 28 in particular we know that some prophets had come down from Jerusalem to Antioch and then you'll notice in verse 28 one of them named Agabus stood up and began to indicate by the Holy Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine all over the known world the point there is that you had prophets during that period of time and sometimes of course we know prophets would receive what we would think of as special revelation divine revelation but you'll notice it came via the Holy Spirit as well. Now, of course, today we have sometimes confusion over this. And essentially what you have is you have a closed canon of Scripture. In other words, we're not going to have 3rd and 4th Peter, 3rd and 4th Thessalonians. We have all of the special or divine revelation. God's given us everything we need in the books of the Bible. Today, the way it works is that the Lord speaks to us, you might say, if you ever heard someone use that expression, through some different means, uh, through prayer, through the Holy Spirit, through the Scripture in particular. Those are the means in which God speaks to us, we might use that phrase today. I'm always a little cautious with that because that can have different connotations. But basically what you have is, of course, the Lord speaks through prayer. We pray. Uh, he speaks through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever had a time where you felt nudged? I need to call someone. I need to pray for them. I need to fill in the blank. We also, of course, are grateful for the complete Bible we have. We don't need any more revelation. God's given us everything we need there. And, of course, we have... I believe also you should include with that the Lord speaks to us or gets messages across through us through other people uh, sometimes through different people we encounter we also don't know we may entertain angels unaware for instance so we see that they had prophets there we also see that they had teaching so there's a distinction and role there you have to teaching and that means to explain something to take and explain and that really is what the prominent role began to have rather than having more revelation more books of the Bible said another way we have that completed and then you have evangelist and teachers now for instance you see that in Ephesians 4 11 and the Lord gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. And so the Lord had those different, if you will, groups there that used. And of course the teaching, curiously enough, that is where we get the idea of exposition. To take what the Bible has, to teach it, to explain it and to see what we might draw from it from our lives, the principles and such that's the means the Lord uses to build up his church so what we see in verse 1 there is that the church is made up of many kinds of people with varied gifts uh, there's no Lone Ranger church there's no solo church where everything is dependent upon one individual but the if you will plurality of people there using the gifts the Lord has given to them and of course that's the same at Decatur you have a variety of people who have a variety of gifts each of them used 
for the Lord's purposes to build up the church, to further the mission of the gospel, and all of those things. And we do those because we're all different, and that's one of the beauties of the church is that. Now lastly, we're going to look at verses 2-3, through three, set apart by the Holy Spirit, and so let's begin by reading those. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So you see clearly here that the men were not idle as they were actively in service, but notice it is service unto the Lord, it is ministry to the Lord, very similar to Colossians 3.24, that our service is to be rendered ultimately to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, that does, of course, impact other people, but ultimately we are serving the Lord in what we do. Now, you'll notice here that the Holy Spirit says, so again, it's important in the book of Acts to remember, and also for today, that the Holy Spirit is leading, it's guiding what is being done here. They didn't choose, is probably a better way to say this, Paul and Barnabas, or Saul and Barnabas said another way. They did not choose to go out. They didn't say, well, you know, I think I'd like to go out on this missionary journey. In fact, what you have here is the Holy Spirit speaking. Perhaps this is through one of those prophets, uh, that he had convicted uh, one of the prophets to let them know this. But in any event, ever how it occurred, the main thing to notice here is that it's the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, who sets apart both Saul and Barnabas to the work which he had called them. Notice I had called them to. Now, I won't read these passages. You can look at them on their own, but you'll notice in Galatians 1.15, Paul saw himself as set apart at birth. Romans chapter 1 and verse 1, set apart at conversion, and here, set apart for the missionary work that the Lord had called him to do. The question is with this for us is, are we sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading? And maybe you could put it this way, does the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us and we are submissive to it, or do we lead ourselves? And of course, I'm sure at times we do a little bit of both but you see here the importance of yieldness to the Spirit because ultimately that's what we want we want at whether it be in our lives or at the church here we want the Spirit leading us guiding us to do the things that he has asked us to do but then I'll draw your attention to verse 3 before we conclude today Paul and Barnabas are sent off, but notice a few things about this church in Antioch. Of course, scripture was very important. You have the teaching aspect, the teaching ministries, but you also have prayer, you have fasting, service, the Holy Spirit's power and leading there, and they lay their hands upon Barnabas and Saul. Now, this is not ordination like what we would think of today. But the church is simply identifying and confirming them. But I want us to look at one thing before we finish today, which is the very last phrase of verse 3. And it said, when I read it, they sent them away. In Greek, it gives the idea of they let them go. Now think of how unselfish this is, but also how yielding to the Lord's will this is. It would probably be hard to have, and I could imagine being a pastor saying, well, Barnabas and Saul, we need to have them go do this, this missionary work in this case. Imagine them having to leave, you have to let them go. So again, imagine that, and what we see here is a church that was unselfish, that was yielding to the Lord's will, in other words, the Lord's will above their own. And that's really what we should do. There is, of course, you want your people to stay, and you want them to serve there, but there are times where we have to be willing to let them go because what is best? Well, to do the Lord's will, to yield to the Spirit of God.
and such. Now, I'll take questions and uh, we'll have some time for discussion in just a moment, but uh, just a few things as we finish up. We see here the church is made up of many kinds of people with many varied gifts, and it is the same here. Various people with various gifts that need to be used. I ran across this quote. It said, They seem to have done this without a committee report, without a demographic analysis, and without a marketing survey. Barnabas and Saul went out without any of these things, only with the call and the power of the Holy Spirit. I like that quote because we can so often look to the world for direction, and clearly that's not the case here. Clearly Paul and Barnabas went out with the Holy Spirit's calling, in other words, his directing them. But they went out with the power of the Holy Spirit because without the Spirit, they don't have power in themselves to do the work the Lord has called them to do. And so we end with, are we sensitive to the Lord's leading in our own lives and in the church? And may we endeavor to increase in that. We'll have some time for questions and discussion, but uh, if you want to read ahead, next week we'll look at verse 4 through verse 12 and the word of God goes out and they have difficulties they encounter conflict as the word of God goes out how do they deal with that and we'll see how that occurs so we'll take some time for discussion and comments